Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> Thanks for joining me today. Yes. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So we're definitely going to hop into introducing you. Um, I typically start off by <laughs> saying hello to the, the audience, and I totally forgot to do that. So hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast, where we talk about all things related to mental health, Black culture, and our faith. I'm your host, Dr. Shonda. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, and y'all know we do this every single week, where we talk about things that you guys are interested in, which is mental health. Uh, so make sure you guys continue to tune in, continue to share this video or audio version of the podcast wherever you're listening and tuning in from. And don't forget that this podcast is brought to you by the Revolt Podcast Network, which is anchored in hip hop and powered by creators. I am so excited to be here with Miss Tamu Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Shonda. Yes. So if you don't mind, would you mind uh, introducing us to you and kind of letting us know who you are and what you do? Yes. So I am Tamu Lewis. I am the co-founder and board president of the Lee Thompson Young Foundation, which my mom and I started in 2014 after losing my brother, actor Lee Thompson Young, to suicide in 2013. So we really wanted to help others become aware uh, about mental health and really educate others and, and families and loved ones um, so that they could be more prepared and proactive and, and supportive um, when dealing with families and loved ones that have mental illness. Yes. I cannot wait to dive deeper into some of the work that you and your mother are doing um, but let me just first say, it definitely was a, a pleasure and honor to be able to grow up with your brother. Um, <laughs> and what I mean by that is I'm a millennial. So, of course, I didn't have the opportunity to actually meet him. But trust and believe, every day we came home from school, me and my cousins, we would turn on the TV and watch the famous Jet Jackson. And that was just a part of our routine. Like, right. we literally felt like we grew up with the famous Jet Jackson. Uh, and so, you know, just if you can kind of give us like a, a deeper dive into how it was growing up with Lee Thompson Young and how he was as a, a, a child actor in, in a very successful career. Yes. So I am 12 years older than my brother. So I was like a junior mom. So um, he was always a very bright child, um, very inquisitive talkative. I think he knew at the age of 10 that he wanted to be an actor. He asked my mom to um, get some business cards made for him. And mm -hmm. she's like, well, what would the business cards say, Lee? And he's like, they will say Lee Thompson Young, actor. So he knew then, um, even prior to age 10, he would ask to volunteer at the local library, public library, to read stories to other children. So he'd be sort of performing as he read these stories and he was involved in the local children's workshop theater, um, always at the top of his class in terms of academics. So just very bright and, and gifted all around, you know, artistically, creatively, and academically. Wow, that's amazing. So, so what was it like, um, kind of like transitioning in from, uh, wanting to pursue an acting career to actually being on the Disney Channel, which was huge. Yes, yes. So he initially, I believe like the first big thing that at least I remember is like, a, a, I think there was a Robitussin commercial that was national. And then there was a McDonald's commercial. Um, and we went to these regional um, talent scouting type of events. And we went to one, I believe it was in Hilton Head, South Carolina. And that's where a New York manager and agent um, noticed him. And he won all the particular like contests in his age group. And um, after that, they, they basically convinced my mom to try it out for a summer, to go to New York and let the agent try to book him for the summer. And that's when he got the couple of national commercials. And then that's when she's like, OK, so we, we can we can go all in on this and um, move to New York um, so that he could pursue his career and go to the School of the Arts there. And then that's what kind of led to being on the, the Disney Channel. 
Yeah. And so like the the family transitioning to New York and being on the Disney Channel, I wonder um, what was that that shift like in the family? Well, I think um, for my mom, it it kind of all lined up because she was considering um, a second career at that time. And she got into a program at Union Theological Seminary to get her uh, master's in divinity and then Ph.D. So she could do that in New York. And I'm 12 years older. So by that time, I'm out on my own. Um, so she, you know, she didn't have to be concerned with having to uproot me. So it was just really about my brother and giving him that exposure and opportunity. So I think, you know, it's a transition, of course, moving from Columbia, South Carolina to New York. But I think everyone was just so excited and um, supportive of my brother. And we could see the talent and the love that he had and passion that he had for for acting. So I feel like it was a, a fairly easy transition. Yeah. So what was it like? Like, when did you realize that he was starting to grow in like his notoriety and like he was becoming, quote unquote, like famous? I would say um, probably during the the holidays when he had time off, um, he would always visit me here in Atlanta and we would be out doing normal things, shopping or a grocery store or whatever. And people would just be like, you know, girls would just be losing it. Like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> and like, do you think I can say hello to him? I'm like, yeah, you can, you can say hello to him. Um, so I think then is when, you know, when we saw the kind of general public um, that would come up or just kind of be starstruck, that's when we realized, oh, this is like a really big deal. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. You know, I, I definitely probably w- would have been one of the people starstruck yes. um, because it was just amazing to see, um, just someone who looked like us on TV. Like it was the representation that was so uh, monumental at that time for us as kids. Yes. Amazing. (laughs) I'm wondering, so like when you think about, you know, um, you know, Lee Thompson Young and the experiences that he's had growing up, uh, when did you start to notice that he was experiencing difficulty with regard to like his mental health? I would say late teenage years, so around 19 or so, and um, we didn't really have any exposure to someone who had been diagnosed or really know how to recognize any signs or anything like that. So I think around the age of 19, and I I wasn't there, um, but my mom was um, in New York where it was just maybe some odd behavior or like confusion like nothing um, scary or anything like that, but just out of the ordinary. It didn't seem like himself. Um, And I think that was the first time when she initially kind of reached out to a doctor just to make sure he was okay. But by the time, I think it was fast. So by the time they got to the doctor, the doctor is basically like relying on my brother to, to say what happened. And then my mom to talk about anything that she noticed, but it, by then it's like past tense. Sure. And it was over. So um, it was more like, uh, just, you know, get some rest. So they couldn't really diagnose anything because they didn't have enough to go off of, Mm -hmm. but that, you know, 19 was the the first time I would say. Okay. Okay. After about 19, is that when you, you guys started to notice like a pattern of behavior? It was um, in his case, it was hard to notice a pattern because there would be like years between anything coming up. Mm -hmm. And I think so, and this is just my opinion, of course, but I think because he was extremely uh, talented um, and intelligent, I think he did a phenomenal job of masking it. Whereas maybe your average person um, maybe not be able to mask it as well. So I think there were a lot of times when maybe he wasn't feeling like himself, but we couldn't tell because he didn't want for us to be able to tell. So I think after 19, it might have been a good, mm, I don't know, five years or so before something else happened outwardly that we could notice and then realize, okay, now we, we need professional support and it lasted longer. So then the doctor had, you know, evidence, so to speak, um, to be able to diagnose the bipolar disorder. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and so like, as you were, were speaking, I, I was definitely going to inquire about that because um, it seems like, you know, your brother was very talented. Um, you talked about him being very intelligent. Oftentimes when individuals are what we call like high achieving, um, it does become a bit more difficult for them to um, actually like present with symptoms that would make the disorders diagnosable right. at specific times. So right. it sounds like that that probably played a role in um, the identifying the bipolar disorder. Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. OK. okay. Um, so when he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I wonder, like, how did that impact him and also like the family? So so he made um, a decision to keep it to himself. So my mom knew and I knew and he knew. Right. Um, but he asked to uh, keep it private. Sure. And I think that at the time, people still really weren't talking about mental illness and, and certainly not like bipolar disorder specifically and, mm -hmm. you know, how you could function or not. And I think he was really concerned about his career being blackballed um, in Hollywood. Yeah. So we, of course, like, OK, you know, we won't tell anyone he's seeing a psychiatrist. He's taking this medication. He seems fine. Like now we know, you know, what we're dealing with. And so we, we honored his wishes, which, you know, in hindsight, I would say if I knew then what I learned afterwards, I would have talked to him and tried to convince him mm -hmm. to at least let his community of support know in L.A. Because by then, I live in Atlanta. My mom was on the East Coast. She was a professor at Howard University at the time. So there's no actual like family there with him. So I think it would have been helpful for some of his closest friends to know because then if there were some signs, they could they they would have context, mm -hmm. right? To pick up on those and alert us or, you know, reach out to mental health professionals or or whatever his, you know, safety plan would have been that he would have put in place. But I didn't know that. So and high functioning again comes into play. Right. Because I'm like, OK, wait, he seems fine. Right. So um, that, that's where we that's where we left it. So what would happen any time that he would feel um, off balance, and that's my term, he would call myself and or my mom and let us know. And then one of us would go to LA um, to support him. And he was so high functioning that it never impacted his work. Mm -hmm. he, he was always, you know, there on set, nailing all the lines or whatever project he was working on. We would just be there, you know, a week or so, um, go with him to the doctor and that kind of thing. And then he'd be fine again. Um, maybe sometimes there were some adjustments in medications, then he'd be fine again. And then we would leave and come back home and, you know, go on with things. That I think that really highlights how sometimes like the, the stigma associated with mental health can cause so many people to, to suffer in silence, like right. going through so much, um, but feeling as though they have to keep it inside due to the, the fear of like what other people might think or say. Right. Right. I wonder, like, did did he talk about like the stigma at all or like the, this overarching fear of that? No, he didn't really. It was almost just like a, you know, matter of fact, I'm not I'm not telling everybody, anybody, you know, um, I'm fine and I, I can deal with this and I'll let you guys know when I need support. And like, that's it. There was not really any in-depth discussion about like mm -hmm. stigma you know, it was just that initial time where he was like, I don't want it to negatively impact my career. I don't want people to judge me. Um, and that's that. Yeah. Do you feel as though, so like when you, in, in today's world, right? So, so many actors, so many artists are coming out and saying, you know, I'm depressed. I have anxiety. I have bipolar disorder. And I wonder like what what comes up for you when you hear so many people talking about it nowadays? Because you're right, back in you know 2013 and before that, we weren't talking about this like that, especially in mainstream Hollywood. Right, exactly. So it, it makes me feel good, actually. I am glad that people are talking about it. Um, I think that's helpful. I think it does give others permission 
to reach out when they need help or when they, you know, feel like something is off um, with them, even if they don't have a diagnosis or the words to articulate what's happening with them. Um, so I think it's good that it is being discussed. I do, however, feel like sometimes that maybe is kind of glossed over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, people share what they're comfortable with sharing. And anything you share, I think, takes courage. So I applaud that. Um, but I, I don't want um, mental illness and specifically in this case, bipolar disorder to be sort of um, watered down, um, for lack of a better word, because and it, it it's different for each person, too. So if you see, you know, a particular celebrity, it comes out and says they have it and, they, and they're like so successful and, you know, they have the support that they need. Um, you know, I don't want everyone else to think that that is the case for anyone who has it or mm -hmm. that someone who has it can also achieve at that level mm -hmm. because maybe they can, but maybe not depending on how it impacts them and what their actual symptoms are and their, you know, specific circumstances. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, your work that you're doing is so important. And even, you know, hearing stories about um, Lee Thompson Young, because sometimes people do have that cookie cutter mindset, like depression only looks this particular way, or, right. you know, bipolar disorder only looks this particular way. When in actuality, you know, it, it's, it's dynamic. Like there are so many different ways where um, how it can present in different people. So it's how it's important to highlight like all of these stories. Um, yeah. So so when thinking about overall, um, when when Lee Thompson Young completed suicide, I, I wonder what was that like for you and the family to to find out, and you know how did that impact you all? Yeah, it was um, really difficult uh, because for me, and I've, I'll speak for myself. Um, being 12 years older and sort of like his um, protector. I thought of myself as his protector. And then this happened. So then I feel like I failed him, right? I didn't protect him from this. Um, and when he had called, which, you know, he completed in August. So I saw him, see, February of 2013, he was not feeling like himself. He called, I went, I stayed a couple of weeks that time. Then everything was fine, came home. I ended up seeing him in July, so just a month before, um, in July in Hawaii, and we hadn't even planned it, but he was on a vacation, and I was on a vacation with my husband and another couple, so we were able to hang out and everything, and I, he seemed fine, you know, in, in Hawaii, um, and I'd probably talk to him a week. We normally talked at least once a week, so I talked to him like the week before um, he completed so I felt angry. Um, I felt guilty, like I, sh I missed something. How did I not know? Um, and I ended up having to go to therapy to deal with the grief um, because it was just so heavy to me. And I felt like there were times I felt like I couldn't breathe. Um, meanwhile, I have a husband, a career. I had two daughters. Um, so I couldn't just like collapse and ball up, but that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so very, um, just, you know, very difficult and, and, and challenging for all of us. And, you know, what came out of that was my mom saying, we have to educate people because to be honest myself, I didn't really become educated about it until we lost him because, he was just so high functioning. I'm like, okay, bipolar disorder. Okay, you take this medicine. You're so successful. You're doing all these things. You know, he graduated um, as a C with honors from University of Southern California from their film and TV program. He was a National Merit Scholar in high school. So it was just, you know, he seemed to be doing fine, except for these little episodes, or I call them little episodes, but except for these times. And so it was just um, it was it was hard, hard to deal with. I can imagine. I can imagine. And um, I, I love how you not only highlighted 
grief, but you know, there's anger associated with that. There was guilt associated with that. And oftentimes we don't realize like how complicated grief can be. Like it, it can have so many different types of emotions there. So I do appreciate that vulnerability that you're sharing. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned something there and I, I just kind of want to touch on it a bit. I feel, especially as, as black women, uh, we, we have a lot on our plates, right? Yes. A lot of times we, we have the careers, we have the families, we have children that we have to tend to. But when we're going through, we feel like, you know, how am I supposed to cope with these emotions and show up for my family and do everything else that's on my plate, right? Right. How did you, how did you kind of like manage that the aftermath and, and cope with these things and, and put your own mental health at the forefront? Well, I didn't initially, right? So I just kept pushing. I kept um, working and doing things with my girls. I just, I just kept pushing forward because I felt like I had to, mm -hmm. and it, it really had to come to me having like physical ailments, like actual physical um, chest pains. You know how they say you can actually have a broken heart. Yes. So I, so I began to have these chest pains, and I would just be like driving and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe, like almost like a, a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, I was dealing with the anger. So at one point um, I, I had to pull over because the pain got so bad in my chest and I called my mom and I said, you know, I, sh I shouldn't be dealing with all of this because I'm the one who stayed. Like, why is it mm -hmm. so hard for me? Um mm -hmm. And she was like, you, you, you have to, you have to get help. Like you cannot get sick from this. You know, you're, yeah. you're going to end up, you know, really doing harm in terms of my health. Um, just trying to keep pushing and deal with all of this. So she was basically like, you, you have to. So what happened, I mentioned that I was in therapy. So that was talk therapy. Mm -hmm. Right. But when the emotions just got to be too much and really impacting my physical health and how I could get through the day, my therapist is like, you're going to have to see a psychiatrist. So I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I need to see a psychiatrist. And she's like, you, you're going to, you, I think you need some medication that will really help you get through this period mm -hmm. um, for the, the depression. And I was livid. So then I was really angry. Like, this is ridiculous. So then I was like, okay, okay. Because I kept thinking about my girls. Okay, I'll, I'll make this appointment. My husband traveled a lot. And so when the appointment was scheduled, he wasn't going to be here. And he said, is that okay? Or do you want me to ask? Oh, she'd be fine. Well, the morning of, I got up to drive to this appointment with this psychiatrist. And I just, I just froze. And then I just cried. Like, I didn't want to go, just crying about the state I was in, crying about the loss of my brother. And I thought, I now I told my husband it was fine that I could make it to this appointment, right? So I'm like, okay, I get in the car, I'm crying. It takes like 30 minutes to get there. And I'm like, okay, what can I do to get myself to this appointment? And I, I called a relative who lives in town and at my cousin, I asked him to meet me there. Okay, but still, I'm driving by myself. How am I still going to get to this appointment? So then something said, call one of my girlfriends whose mom had um, died by suicide. She happened to answer, because this is a weekday, so she's at work. But she happened to answer, and she talked to me all the way till I got to the appointment. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, my cousin was there, so he could walk in with me, and we could you know, do this. And it was you know, very helpful. It was just getting over whatever I had created in my mind about having to go to the psychiatrist and just the whole state that I was in. Um, but once I got that help um, with the, the medication for, you know, just a, a period of time to kind of get me through the rough patch, it, it was very helpful. So I do, you know, disclose that information so that people know it's okay. And you might need different help than you think. I know I love that vulnerability because so many people experience that that level of discomfort and anxiety when it comes to seeing a therapist and 
even seeing a psychiatrist, like needing medication. And it's definitely nothing to be ashamed of. Right. Um, so I, I do appreciate you for highlighting that. Yeah. It sounds like your support system played a, a significant role in you being able to kind of overcome that that phase, that experience you were having. Can you can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I was just um, talking to my older daughter about me, the need for community and that yes. it's not that you need community because you have some challenges or a mental illness, um, but everyone needs community. So um, definitely the support of my family, um, my girlfriends, they had what they called a, a love circle and they, they would just kind of be in tune of when they needed to call the love circle together. And they would come to my side of town and take me to dinner and just, you know, talk to me about whatever and, you know, love on me. And it's just, you know, whole group of, of sisters um, that were there, you know, there to support me. And I remember my mom um, saying, because at the time she, she didn't live here in Atlanta. So she um, put together like a prayer circle. So, and I think it was maybe five women, you know, one of which was my aunt. Um, and so every, I think it was Saturday mornings at 8 a.m., you know, I would call in and they would have this prayer circle for me. Um, so there was there were multiple things that uh, my support community did to help me through the process, um, which I really appreciate. Because one of the things I remember when it was really tough was that I couldn't articulate it to anyone. I just couldn't find words to express the pain and all the emotions that I was having. And I also felt like I was alone. And of course we tell people you're not alone, yeah. but I felt like I was alone because I was like, well, I'm his sister. I'm not his mom. So people keep checking on my mom, but people, you know, they're like, whatever, you're the, you're the sibling, right? And um, I was like, no, I, you know, it, it, it's more than that. And we were really close and my home was home. He came home here, you know, two, three times a year, anytime he had a break. Um, so it was, um, like I said, I just, I just really felt alone. So anytime that my community could support me and not ask me for an explanation mm -hmm. was great. <laughs> yes. Because we don't always have the explanation. Sometimes we cannot put into words how we're feeling and that's okay. Yeah, that's why it's so important to have that supportive community uh, that you highlighted. Um, even thinking about kind of like what you and your mom are currently doing with the Lee Thompson Young Foundation. Can you tell us a bit about when that was established and what came about your decision and what type of work that you're doing currently to continue the legacy? Yeah, so I, I'll say this first. You know, when you have um, a loss, they tell you not to make any major decisions in the first year, yes. right? And we launched a foundation like a month after. So oh. <laughs> first thing, I don't recommend that um, because I kind of had to learn as I went, you know, I'm trying to help people, but I'm like, had just started the healing process. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I would share sometimes and just, and people would line up after the talks, you know, to talk to me, but it had like literally just happened. So I would be so emotionally drained and, and exhausted afterwards. But I learned that, OK, I can, uh, you know, I can present. Actually, I don't have to be the one to present. Other people can present. You know, I don't even have to go. So anyway, so those things I learned um, as I went along yeah. uh, through my healing journey. And initially, we really wanted to focus on youth. So we came up with um, programs where we would go talk to the youth in the schools. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to support like parents and the teachers as well, because the youth are in school like most of the day, right? Mm -hmm. So we would do these workshops um, with the different audiences uh, in the schools. And we would have like a licensed social worker or a licensed therapist would always be part of uh, the team to be able to answer questions as a mental health professional, because I'm an advocate. I'm not a mental health professional. Right. Mm -hmm. So we would do those things initially. Um, and then we just the programs evolved to where we prior to the pandemic, 
we had um, small group sessions in the uh, public schools here in Atlanta where the counselors would identify like five to six students who could benefit from a mental health professional coming in for once a week for five weeks, five consecutive weeks to really build that relationship mm -hmm. and teach them coping skills, right? Because challenges are going to come up, but it's about building resiliency and coping skills when these things do come up and giving them the language to express themselves when mm -hmm. there's something going on and it really is needing more uh, mental health professional help. So we were doing those things up until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had to kind of shift to virtual where we would have sessions with the school staff um, virtually to kind of help them support the students. And then now we just launched um, a mindfulness scholarship where we want to really focus on helping uh, high school seniors who would be graduating and transitioning to college, because I think that is um, a challenging time. It's a transition, right? And so we provide them with financial support, but then also mental health support, peer support, but then mental health professionals too, to kind of do coaching sessions with them to help them with the transition. That is amazing work that you all are doing. Seriously. Um, yes, yes. Because our students are struggling. Uh, like in general, across the country, there is certainly a mental health crisis, uh, especially when it comes to um, children of color, like black children. And the fact that you all are like, going out there in the trenches at the schools, I think that is really giving them the support that they need in order to overcome some of these life challenges. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering, so how can people support the Lee Thompson Young Foundation and where can we find you all? Yes, so you can go to our website. It's ltyfoundation.org. So it's just my brother's initials, ltyfoundation.org. And of course you can make a donation there. Um, we have our scholarships applications open right now. So if you know any high school seniors, they are welcome to apply. And we tried to make the application like really um, simple because we want it to appeal to the greatest number of students. So mm -hmm. I think you have until May the 31st to apply for that scholarship. Awesome. And then um, I have a, a book that I wrote and published um, last year called Surviving the Mental Health Tank. You can find that on the ltyfoundation.org website as well. And we're on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. I cannot wait for the listeners to connect with you all because, again, the work that you're doing is amazing. Uh, before we head out, Ms. Tamu, if you can kind of give us one piece of advice or uh, just a, a level of insight, something that you would tell to someone who might be struggling and, and suffering in silence. I would say, and that's hard because pe people who are um, dealing with some challenges, I think you do feel alone and you do feel like people won't understand you. So I would say to use brain evidence, right? Because most of us are here and we aren't actually alone. So whether that's your family or your friends, or even your coworker that you have a bond with, your classmate that you have a bond with. Like, think about your life prior to this moment that you're in when you're experiencing the challenges. Think about the things that you've already come through and maybe who's been with you along the way. And that can give you evidence that that is someone, right? Maybe I can reach out to them, even if you don't know what to say. You can reach out to those people because you know they've been there before. So try to just remove yourself from that present moment and think about, you know, what you've already been through, what you've already overcome, mm -hmm. too. And that can just give you some hope and some encouragement that you can make it through this, too, and that you don't have to do it alone. Yeah, I think that's wonderful advice, uh, simply because. When we always when we feel alone, it doesn't always mean that we are alone. So yeah. um, leaning into that advice, I, I think will be so helpful for so many people. I appreciate you for coming through. Oh, thank you, Dr. Shonda. I appreciate you having me.
For sure, for sure. We're definitely going to connect in the future. Uh, so make sure that you all connect with Miss Tamu uh, and the, the foundation, the Lee Thompson Young Foundation. So everything will be in the show notes. Uh, make sure that you guys tune in next week as we continue these kind of conversations. And don't forget that you have the power to create the emotions that you want to experience. 